guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but you are mighty. Friends, when the Israelites first sang these words, these lines, when the Israelites first heard these lines from this hymn, so to say, they knew what it means to be a pilgrim in this barren land. They knew what it takes to be a pilgrim in a barren land of ours. Because a pilgrim is a wanderer. He has no permanent abode. She has no permanent resting place. And these call themselves pilgrims because they are strangers in this barren land. The word is strangers. And that is what we have become. We are all pilgrims in this barren land. We are all strangers in this barren land. Because this is not our home. Earth is not our home. We have a better home in heaven with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ the King. Christ the King. Arise, call you faithful. Rejoice and renew. So as we look at these beautiful lines from that hymn, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer, take him through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art uh, mighty. It also reminds us of our responsible psalm for today. I love you, Lord, my, my strength. It is only Jesus who makes the equation perfect. The equation is balanced only when you know that God is the one who is mighty. Because, friends, we are weak. It is only when we see God as our strength that we can survive in this valley of tears, we pray. So, if we don't have this recognition, we don't come to this acceptance, we might be walking in life, heading nowhere. So, when God spoke to the Israelites, in the first reading, the book of Exodus, a, a book that talks about pilgrimage, in a way, Exodus. It talks about pilgrims, strangers. He spoke to them, saying, You listening to me, you Catholics, you Christians, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him or oppress her. You listening to me, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him because the Israelites knew themselves that they were once strangers it will say that, listen because you were once strangers in the land of Egypt and then he continues you shall not afflict any widow or orphan if you have taken note of the lines I'm reading you would realize that a pilgrim, a stranger, a widow orphan in those days and even now are people who don't have 100% dependence. Somehow, certain things of their lives have been taken away. They don't get everything of life. And so God is telling them that, look, I am a God of even those who are less privileged. Amen. Because your God is a God of even the less privileged, it means his eyes are on you. If God surely concentrates his eyes on those of us who are doing so well in life, those of us who have everything moving on well in life, those of us who have our families and friends around us, then some of us will not meet his eyes ever. But the eyes of God are upon we who even feel that we are weak, we are strangers, we are widows, we are orphans. This is a God we serve. So much that it has become part of the law of the Israelites that they should have love for the poor, the weak, and these were the words that were spoken to them to remind them of their own identities as pilgrims in this barren land, as strangers, as foreigners down here below. And so when God spoke these words to the Israelites, they took them seriously. And friends, let us also take them seriously. Sometimes we are tempted to look at only our families, our friends, our church members. You see, we are making the equation very limited only things that concern us. 
But today, God wants you to open your eyes and look beyond. People you have never taken notice of. Look at the person sitting next to you, those behind you. We come to church, we greet ourselves, and yet we don't even know where the person is staying. We see some people are in difficulties, and we could help them. I would say, that is not my business. I have a family to take care of. God wants us to begin to look at those we call less privileged in our midst, in and outside us. And for us who feel that we are also less privileged, God is reminding us that we are also part of his family. Amen. Amen. We are also part of his church. Amen. Amen. This should be encouraging words to those of us who feel left behind, who feel not recognized, not seen, even in the house of God. And then the passage continues. If you lend money to any of my people, with you who is poor, you shall not be to him as a creditor. You see, in the Lord's Prayer, there's this line that says, forgive us our trespasses. Some Bible says, forgive us our debts. As we ourselves are what? Debtors. As we say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The point of life is that for the rest of your life, once you come to this earth, you are in debt to God. We are all debtors to God. We are all owing God somehow. And yet, God doesn't come every day asking for us to pay back. So when he spoke to the Israelites that, look, when you offer help, don't make it your desire to make that person feel that she's not, he's not, you know. Let us also learn from this, that let us offer help from the bottom of our hearts. Yes, when you give help from the bottom of our hearts, then we don't even count the cost, whether the person brings back or not, because God himself will pay us. And this is about the gift of sharing what God gives us as Catholics, as Christians. God ends his passage by saying that when you receive someone's cloak, return it to him. The cloak in those days, and now we know, was a sign of somebody's livelihood because it was the only material the person used when he or she is going to bed. So if you seize it, you are the Depriving the person of some security for the night. So he reminds them also that those of us who are seizing people's cloaks, some of us are managers at workplaces, we have people working for us. You see, we don't even pay them what is their due. You are seizing their cloak. For some of us to others are seizing our cloaks, we have done our duties and yet we are not being paid. We have been cheated. So we feel that our clothes have been seized. He's speaking to us. Maybe they, you have seized someone's cloak in not forgiving the person. So set her free, set me free. God is saying, give back that cloak of forgiveness. He's speaking to us this morning. You have to learn how to let go something in order to have God for ourselves. Amen. I'll end with the gospel. In the gospel, we hear Jesus giving us the story of what happened when the Sadducees came to him. Anyway, for your information, the Sadducees had come to him before in the verses 23. We are reading from verses 34 of the gospel, Matthew 22. But in the verses 23, the Sadducees, the Sadducees had come to Jesus and had put a question to him and he had answered them. So the Pharisees now come and they ask him also a question, which is the greatest commandment. First lesson, certain questions are for Jesus alone. Please don't forget this. Certain questions are for Jesus alone. If you know questions that are reserved for Jesus, it will help you a lot, a great deal to handle life. You know, our challenge is that sometimes we come to Jesus Sometimes we go to people with misplaced questions. Some questions can be answered by Jesus alone. Though we are told the Pharisees came to tempt Jesus, trap him, but they knew that this question is only Jesus who can answer. Maybe the year is almost finishing. We are in October. There are some questions that you have been asking since January, and there are no answers to. Begin to present them to Jesus. Amen. It's time to bring those questions to Jesus. He's the only one who can answer you 
give answers to those questions that are waiting some answers. And when they put that question to Jesus, what happened was that Jesus gives them two answers. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. We know that. And then love your neighbor as yourself. They had come asking for one greatest commandment. And yet Jesus gives them the greatest and gives them a bonus. I have come to realize, and probably you also have, that whenever we come to Jesus, he gives us more than we even want. They came asking for one. He gives them, he gives them two. He gives them a deeper understanding of what it means to love God and neighbor. And love God because God is the creator of the universe. God is our creator. Love neighbor because every person made the image and likeness of God. If you read the book of Apocalypse, Revelations, there is a line that says that when we are all created by God, we are given a name known to him alone. And a time will come that he will call that name we shall run to him faster than light. God has given us life, yet God will also come and ask for how we made use of this life. It's our prayer that we continue to worship God, we shall learn to love God, we shall learn to love neighbor, we shall learn to love everyone amongst us and around us. And may the grace of God be on our hearts our lips. Amen. Amen.